important that we as interviewers get to interview an interviewer. Uh, he's a really interesting guest, a PPE graduate from Oxford, a BBC journalist. He's interviewed Boris Johnson, Warren Buffett, some pretty established figures. Besides working at the BBC, he's also worked for the UK Fiscal Institute and also has published the book Post Truth. With him today, we're trying to discuss the gigantic or very small elephant that has just left the room, Great Britain. We understand that he has an expertise as a moderator and interviewer that's separate than the typical politicians we interview. And with his kind of ingrained expertise, we want to understand the nuance and truth that surrounds the issues surrounding Brexit today, Britain in general, and its future. But for now, a warm welcome, Mr. Evan Davis. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, James. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Great pleasure to be here. Good to see you. Here. So, before we start talking a lot about you, we're going to be a little bit egotistical and speak about ourselves. Okay. So, for me, it's a bit difficult to balance the commitments of being an interviewer and also university and also a social life. But for you, that's ten times worse, I'm assuming. You know, more controversial guests, uh, I guess more publicity in general. It's quite a simple question, but does this ever become too much for you? No. Um, no, I enjoy my job. Basically, I go in each morning. I have an hour radio show at 5 o'clock each evening on, on BBC Radio 4. Um, it's, there's not so much preparation you can do because each show is different every day. So I go in at 10. It's finished at 6. When it's finished, you can't do anything about it. You can't rewrite it or re-record it. It's done. It's live. You just leave. You may regret lots of what you've done, but it leaves me a nice free evening, and um, I don't have to get up early in the morning. There's no point in going in at, at six in the morning because you don't know what you're going to be talking about until sort of lunchtime. So, so no, it's, 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 it's a great, great and privileged job I have, Elmer. And I do combine social life and, and my professional life. The only difficult one is there's this expectation on journalists to write books these days. <laughs> and I did promise a publisher a book. And... Um, I'm, I'm... Regretting I'm, it. I'm, I will a little bit. I... I, I, I that's the bit I find difficult to, to you know, to, to, to do because at the weekend sometimes you don't want to sit and start writing. You want to do something completely different. But no, I enjoy the job, love the job. I, I do want to talk about the regrets because there was one time when I came up here and I tried to shake my guest's hand but they completely ignored it in front of everyone and I would be lying if I said that eight hours later when I was lying in bed I just could not go to sleep for getting that decision. Are there moments that you really regret as a journalist that you wish you could take back in your work? Of course there are. Um, there are moments when I've lost my temper. And I, as an interviewer, I think maybe once every five years you can lose your temper. But I, I, I've mostly regretted being irritable and getting irritated with interviewees. And who? Believe, well, believe me, they often are very irritating. <laughs> but I, you, don't want to, you don't want to show your irritation. You don't want to look like... You don't want to look like you're out of control or you're losing it. And so those are the ones I've regretted. Those are the ones I've regretted. It's, it, interviewing's a big issue in, in the BBC at the moment and in Britain because we have this tradition of interviews being quite argumentative. Um, you know, interviews in Britain, probably more than here, certainly more than the US, they're, they're, they're a fight. You the know, clash of heads. The, the, yeah. the, the point is the interviewer sits and works out, how am I going to make this person look stupid? And then tries to make them look stupid, and they try to make the interviewer look stupid. You're not, you're not going to do and that, that today. Yeah. And I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> that is the way interviews are done. Now, that's actually not my kind of style. So I'm associated at the BBC with a kind of a more friendly, convivial interview style, um, and in which I'm sort of quite civil, quite polite. I don't set out to make them look stupid. Um, I set out with more curiosity than determination to sort of make them look silly. And, and that's why if I do end up being, if I end up being too argumentative and losing my temper, I feel I've failed. Because I think I must be true to my style. My right. style is I'm the friendly one. 
I try and get stuff out of them by being nice and friendly. The good cop. The yeah. good cop, exactly. And then I've got colleagues like Andrew Neil who are much more forensic <laughs> and aggressive. The audience love all of that, by the way. Um, and I like Andrew Neil. I, I think we just need a variety of styles. Right. Yeah. And my style is to be the friendly one, and as, 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 as is yours, obviously. Of, of we course. We try. <laughs> and do, do you find you still get nervous for interviews? You've done this for a long time. Right, so I did have a job at TV, at uh, Newsnight, and I got more nervous on TV than at radio. So yeah. the basic rule is on TV, the audience can see how nervous you are, and that makes you more nervous. Uh, on radio, the audience can't see, and you've got notes, Wikipedia, you've got whatever you want on, on the screens in front of you. So it's much more relaxing on radio. Do you use Wikipedia in a radio um, show? I use Wikipedia. I don't think a day goes by without me using Wikipedia. <laughs> But that doesn't mean I rely on Wikipedia. Um, but you can learn a lot from Wikipedia and then check it out. Yeah, I agree, actually. It's quite I mean, a good don't let knowledge. anybody tell you Wikipedia isn't the best yeah, source no, of information. Completely agree. We use a lot of it. Is, for, it is yeah, yeah. Don't rely on it as the last word. Yeah. But absolutely, it's, it, it, it's, it's brilliant. So we imagine by this point that uh, you're probably very bored of talking about the election, Brexit. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Well, that's good, because that's our first topic. <laughs> and obviously, historic election, a lot has been talked about it and a lot of analysis about the result. And that's kind of where we want to start. And the, the general kind of argument going on in Britain afterwards was, OK, was this the people rejecting Corbyn and his socialism, his pretty socialist manifesto, or was it about, to use the, the famous words, getting Brexit done? Right. I think it was a bit about all of those things, and so we don't need to have an argument about was it this or was it that. I think a lot of people did not warm to Jeremy Corbyn. That's what everybody I know who campaigned tells me from their personal experience, that they didn't like Jeremy Corbyn. Um, so that is a, clearly a factor. Um, the Labour manifesto had a lot of promises. It tested well on each individual promise. But when you added them up, you began to think, can they really do all of this? You know, free broadband, mm. more money for this, money for those pensions. It just began to look very But It's an interesting expensive. point you raise because... So one, in doing our research, one stat we found was that the majority of British citizens were, were scared of Labour, of a Labour government leading to a recession if, if Corbyn got in. But at the same time, as you just said, a lot of their policies were actually pretty popular. And so those two seem to kind of go right, against each do. other. So what you're learning is the complexity of and the subtlety of public opinion. Right. That it is possible to believe I like that and I like that and I like that. But when that is all in one package, I begin to get scared of it. And so I think there were fears. I think there were definitely, on the part of many of the public, some fears of, of Corbyn. But don't underestimate the Brexit factor. 2019, without any doubt at all, was the most traumatic political year in my lifetime, in my country. And I, it, it, you, know, you can liken it to a national nervous breakdown in which politics was very interesting. Parliamentary votes, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of John Burko, the Speaker of the House of Commons. Most people in our country have never heard of the Speaker of the House of Commons. <laughs> Suddenly he's like a big national figure. He's shouting division and they're voting and we're looking at the results time after time. Endless parliamentary games and, and, and attempts to shape the debate. It was traumatic, and a lot of people really, really did think, we need to decide now. This is, this, the game is up. Mm. And, I, you know, the opposition policy on Brexit, remember that Boris Johnson's policy was, we're leaving on January the 31st. The opposition policy was, we got an extension on March the 29th. We got another extension on April the 12th. Another extension on October the 31st to January the 31st. And the first thing we do if we get in is to extend from January the 31st to June the 31st in order to have a referendum in, in, in say, um, in April or, or, or May. And, do you, do you, sorry, and I think a lot of people just thought this is not very attractive. We need to just... 
we need to move on. But do you think that Corbyn would have been better off just saying, taking the Lib Liberal Democrat policy and saying, right, we're going to have a sec uh, we're going to revoke Article 50, no. having so the, more certainty? So the Lib Dem policy backfired spectacularly. Yeah. The public, the Liberal Democrats, much the most pro-Europe party, their policy was, if we win a majority, we just cancel Brexit. No referendum, we just do it on December the 13th. And for a moment, it looked like that might be very attractive because it finishes the issue and that's it. But the truth was, the public, all the signs are, the public felt that was illegitimate and you can't have a referendum and then just overturn it. And so the Lib Dems did surprisingly badly. That was one of the stories no. of the campaign, was that the Lib Dems did very badly. So look, I think honestly there was a demand to get Brexit done. I think there was some fear of Corbyn and Labour um, by certain voters, which wouldn't be surprising. I mean, you know, given the history of British you know, the, the 1983 election, which was a very left-wing manifesto, the mm. British rejected that. Um, so there was a lot going on. There was just a lot going on. And, um, you know, I think it, ultimately a lot of people wanted to get Brexit done. Uh, the, remain, the Remain class had spent three years saying, did the public really mean it when they said <laughs> we want to Brexit? And the election told you that probably 40 to 50% really did mean it. And, 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 and that, was, that was that. Let's talk more about the kind of labor distinction that you see, because there's 50% of the people that thought that if labor won, there would be a recession. But of course, that's partly to blame on the manifesto, and that's also partially to blame on Corbyn. What do you think was a larger player in kind of the skepticism of labor? Was it just Corbyn's attitude in general? Okay, you're, you're, you're trying to sort of pin me down on no, no. specifics, but these Definitely things all not. operate together, right? Yeah. So, um, I think Corbyn could have done better with a less left-wing manifesto, potentially, and a more left-wing manifesto could have done better with potentially mm. a less, less left-wing leader. But it was the package, I think the package didn't add up to having enough appeal to enough people. Um, now, you know, you can't overstate how, how uh, in, in, 19, in, in, in the year 2010, if you'd told me Jeremy Corbyn might potentially be Prime Minister, I would not have believed you. Corbyn was way out of the mainstream, and he became leader in a kind of anti-politics backlash in, 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 in 2015, he, he, he did very well in one election in 2017. And I think we all then thought, wow, politics has changed. And, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, this man who you never thought could win an election, maybe he really could win an election. And in, in 2019, I think what you got was more of a return to the normality. So I think looking at it now... You would, most political analysts, I think, would say 2017, when he did quite well, that was, that was the outlier, that was the, that was the weird one. 2019 was where you would have expected him to be, really, which yeah. was, he, he was, he was, he was, he was a, he was a maverick, yeah. and he was a, a left-wing maverick whose, whose appeal would be to a certain section of the population but a quite large section would always be against him. I'm, I'm still slightly curious about this distinction because the Labour election is coming up, which kind of represents you know, where the Labour direction is going to come up. If it's One, it's a new face, and then it's also the Labour manifesto. I guess the first question is, who do you think will win uh, the leadership yeah. election? And then in regards to the last thing we were talking about, the blame of the manifesto or the person, how that will change those two characteristics? Right, so there are two leading candidates... One is the Corbynite candidate, Rebecca Long-Bailey. The other one is a more centrist candidate, Keir Starmer. Um, so at the moment, you'd say Keir Starmer is the favourite to win. Most of the local parties are supporting him, and most of the, um, he's, got, he's got quite a bit of support from the unions. And, so, and in polling of Labour members, he looks like the more popular. So 
I'm not a betting man. If you're betting, you'd probably put your money on Keir Starmer. But it's by no means a done deal. Um, what does it tell us about Labour? Keir Starmer is the more fundamental change. Rebecca Long Bailey is, we packaged it wrong, but there was no fundamental problem. And new face, repackage, we can go back in and we can have another go. Keir Starmer, no, it's more fundamental than that. We need to appeal more widely. Um, I think Keir Starmer will win. That tells you that the left wing of the Labour Party, the party has been run by its membership, which is predominantly left in the last few years. I think it tells you the left wing activists in the Labour Party are thinking we need to win and that means being more radical. That, I think that, that would be my default assumption. You mean radical compared to Corbyn? We need to, yeah. Sorry, we need to be more radical in overturning what we've been doing, so in, in changing more everything. More to the centre. More, yeah. to the, more to the centre. We, we just need to... We can't go back with the same pitch as we had yeah. last time. So my, my default assumption of Labour is this, and I, I've spoken to one or two party members at their local meetings, that the Corbynites... There are a lot of open-minded Corbynites who are saying we can't go back with another mm. Corbyn mm. and with a similar policy set. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to change more. But all this is to play for, so I might be wrong. I'm just, that's, my, that's my reading of what is going on. Yeah. And that's a surprise, because about two years ago, people were saying the, Corbyn, the, the left of the Labour Party will never let go. They, they've got the keys. They're never going to let go. And this party is now in the hands of the left. But actually, it seems that there are a lot on the left of the party who are saying we need it to be a broad coalition. We're not going to win if we're too far left. And that doesn't mean we have to junk everything, but we need, we need, to, be a, we need to be a party that builds but a coalition. Do you think that broad coalition will actually work as though it's even a compromise that can be established between the people that represent the Corbyn side and Keir Starmer? Right, so yes, I do think that coalition can work. I have no doubt about that. And I don't think it's game up for the Labour Party. I think they can win the next general election. But it will help them enormously if the government, the Tory government is really bad. Um, if the Tory government turns out to be quite good in ways that the public think are important, I think it's quite difficult for Labour to win. They've got a huge mountain to climb. But don't write them off. They can win. Their problem is, is that the thing that Labour governments have tended to do very well is spend more money than Conservative governments. So you have Conservative governments that don't spend any money, then the public gets fed up with bad public services, so they vote for a left-wing government to spend more money. And here's Labour's problem the Conservative government looks like <laughs> it might spend quite a lot of money. So if they spend a lot of money, then Labour have a no. less obvious... Yeah. Agree you know, they, they have less obvious thing on which they can all agree that distinguishes them from the Conservatives. Yep. We're going to distinguish the Conservatives in a second, but first, let's go to the audience questions, if there are any, for Mr. Evan Davis. Right there in the black sweatshirt. Hi there. Um, I just wonder what your take was on the media coverage of when Britain officially left on the 31st, because there was no real discussion on the fact that we've supposedly left without a deal. We're now in a year of limbo, of more talks and discussions. Boris Johnson uh, has again failed to deliver on his promise of supposedly getting Brexit done, and sort of what people were celebrating on that day, because we're still subject to EU laws and regulations, and it was sort of Disappointing to see there wasn't really much discussion. It was more these two different sides and rather an analysis of the actual day itself. What well, the Brexit day itself, last, last, last Friday, a week ago. Um, well, so I think you have to go back to the trauma that was 2019, in which the country didn't know what it was doing. And I think what happened last Friday which clearly was a, a celebration moment for half the country and a, 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 you know, a non-celebration for the other half of the country. Um, I think what happened last Friday was 
we decisively realised that we're moving to the second round of the Brexit game. So we've done part one. We have left the EU. We can't rejoin. Well, we can rejoin, but we now have to, if we rejoin, have to renegotiate an entrant, entry. So we have now moved on. Um, so it's irreversible. That's what happened last week. It is irreversible. And it, 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 it's happened. And so <clears throat> it is true that part two of Brexit is actually where there's a lot of action and that has to be done in the next, the next year, this year. And it's true that the press and the media have been much less vigilant about talking about the detailed issues that we're going to be arguing about for the next year. But the reason why I think the press have been less vigilant is that the issues have immediately become much more detailed and complicated around trade arrangements and fishing agreements and aviation agreements and, um, and the such like. So it's more complicated. And the po population, in my view, anecdotally, is weary of all of this and is now happy to take a little break from Brexit <laughs> And I, my, I would summarise the public view as being, wake us up when something has happened in, um, in September, October, and we'll start talking about it again. In the meantime, let them get on with it, and we'll, we'll see whether it works or doesn't work later in the year. So one of the questions for the media, and we've been asking ourselves this, is do we keep up with the same Brexit kind of intensity of coverage as we have for the last year and I think most of us are feeling it's probably not going to be quite as quite as interesting for the public that a lot of the conversation will move to the sort of the back pages because it's going to get quite detailed um, now there are 15% of the population who are very very remain and feel strongly, and 15% at the other end who feel very strongly on leave, and they're not going to die, and they're not going to drop their interest in this, and they're going to be talking about it. But there are two-thirds of the population who I think are ready to change the subject, to be honest. Um, and what was amazing last week about the Brexit, the Brexit, um, Brexit night, um, it was... It's a huge, it's the most important night in British history since we joined, really. And it was amazing just how little, how little real celebration there was. It was a big thing in Parliament Square of Nigel Farage and his friends. Boris Johnson had a drinks party at number 10 Downing Street. Um, there was a bit of television coverage. And honestly, there weren't people dancing in the streets. It wasn't like we'd won the World Cup and, and people hooting. And it was, it was pretty subdued. It was, it was a fairly quiet night. And um, people got on with their lives, woke up on Saturday morning. And as you say, nothing had changed. <laughs> we'd, we'd all just, but we had Brexited. This is my first trip to the continent since Brexit. And I was thinking, oh my God, I've come to the continent of Europe. Um, and there was a little, at, at Amsterdam airport, there was a passport control, there was an EU sticker, and then a little, a little Union Jack next to it, just to show you that even though we're not in the EU, we still go through the same queue, because uh, <laughs> nothing has changed. <laughs> <coughs> really, really are all just the same, eh? Same queue, same everything. Um, so you said earlier about the, the Conservatives' plans on spending. That's what we want to talk about next. Um, Boris Johnson has very much positioned himself and his government as almost like a new government. And this is partly because you know, people, people think to themselves, oh, we've had a Tory government for the past 10 years. How could we get another five years of this? So he's kind of spouting the line that it's a different government, different identity. What is that identity? How has the Conservative government Okay, changed? so this is the... I mean, look, let's not underestimate. What Boris Johnson has done is transform the Conservative Party very dramatically in the course of the last six months. It has been an extraordinary thing to see. And 
So, 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 so bear with me here. So firstly, Boris Johnson has gone populist up to a point. But he's also not gone populist the whole way. So Boris Johnson is not Donald Trump. And when you look at the things this government is doing on climate change, uh, even on immigration, um, on many things, it's just it's very different, very different to Trump. So he's not Trump. And if you don't like populists, you could say Boris Johnson is a populist and is a bad prime minister because he's basically a populist. Or you could say Boris Johnson is Western Europe's most successful conqueror of populism because Boris Johnson has squeezed Nigel Farage out of space. Nigel Farage has nowhere to go now because Boris Johnson is dominating. So that's the first thing. But he's changed the Conservative Party by winning northern seats that were traditional Labour seats, by changing the priority of the party to what he calls levelling up, which means making the north of England more successful to give it more of the economic success that is enjoyed by the south of England, by taking on, if you like, blue-collar, working-class, traditional labour concerns, he has, he has transformed the Conservative Party. So it's more public spending, more spending on the north of England, much more infrastructure spending, capital spending on transport around the north in particular. Um, he, he uses the, the phrase One Nation Conservatism, yeah. which uh, has got a long history of yeah. meaning everything and nothing yes. in, in, in England, in the UK. But is that, for Boris, is that what his One Nation Conservatism is? Kind of well, unifying the country, bringing is, the north... It is, it is bringing the north and the south yeah. together. Yeah. And, and he's in a good position because he actually won a lot of northern seats mm. that people said he would never win. Um, these were seats that hated the Tory party. These were seats where the Tory party was toxic, going back to Thatcherism, deindustrialization, the fight with the miners, the coal miners in the 1980s. These were seats that grew to hate the Conservative Party and which decided to vote Conservative. And it's partly... So what it is is... A lot of those seats have fallen out of love with the Labour Party and it's a cultural as much as an economic thing. So they have felt these are blue-collar people who are patriotic, who support British troops when they're fighting overseas. They like the flag. They're sceptical of there being too much immigration. Um, and they want to be tough on crime. So you might call them culturally conservative and economically left-wing. Mm. Okay, so that, that's the Labour... That was the traditional Labour voter in the north of England. Cultural conservative, economically left-wing. Boris Johnson... They've fallen out of love with Labour because Labour is not culturally conservative. No. And they decided to go with Boris Johnson and Boris Johnson is giving them cultural conservatism, not very culturally conservative in fairness, but he's giving them some cultural conservatism and Boris Johnson is going more economically left-wing and that's his pitch to the north of England and that is one nation in his terms because this southern party, the Conservative Party, is now a party for the whole country. So that's the, that is the Boris Johnson reinvention. And it's working because Labour, if you like, had allowed a cultural gap between its values and the, um, and the, the north of England. And Labour, absolutely trapped, of course, because Labour has become a party of the cultural liberals in the country, graduates, big cities... And so Labour support, Labour has taken a lot of support from people who used to vote Conservative. Yeah, yeah. It's Quite it's wealthy it's people, you know, well-educated people with yeah. good jobs who feel culturally closer to the Labour Party. Mm. 
Um, and it just on the day, it just turned out that Boris Johnson was better at taking Labour voters than Labour oh. was at taking Conservatives. You mentioned that the Trump and Boris comparison is not fair, but I think you could say an argument that kind of the bolstering of Northern England is an example of attempting to heal this divide between metropolitans and yeah. provincial people uh, in England. Do you think this is kind of a solution that can be applied to most areas in the Western world, this kind of divide that exists? Right. So I think there is a kind of culture war everywhere um, around what one might call some of these issues, around same-sex marriage and immigration and how tough you are on crime. And so, so you do see that divide. And it's very sharp in the UK. And it sharpened up over Brexit because it became... The Brexit divide became part of this cultural divide generally. Remain voters were warmer to immigration. Remain voters were more likely to be, you know, in favour of rehabilitation rather than retribution for criminals. So that cultural divide has become quite strong. What I think shows where I think left of centre parties need to go is not necessarily to give in on the cultural issues. It's to lower the salience. It's to make them less important. Mm. So if you want to appeal to your traditional voters, if Labour wants to appeal to traditional voters who are culturally conservative and economically left-wing, and you know that that's awkward because you, you know you're winning on the economics and losing on the culture, it's not that you have to say, we're going to hate immigrants and we're going to beat up the gays. You don't have to do any of that. You just have to make sure you're not only talking about cultural issues. Mm. Because I actually, if I'm honest, I don't think northern working class voters in Britain are against immigrants or are against same-sex marriage. I think they probably, they do want their politicians to be talking about their concerns, not just be talking about multiculturalism in London and, what, what I feel and, is and transgender bathrooms. So it's, it's, about those po it's about politicians making sure that if, they are, if there's a cultural gap between them and their voters, they're addressing things their voters want to talk about and they're not mm. just talking mm. about the things that animate their, their base or their graduate membership. You know, they've got to have a lot more to say. My impression, at least just from different kind of articles and, and whatnot, is that it's less specific issues such as immigration or transgender bathrooms, as you said, and it's what I think a lot of people really don't like about uh, the direction the Labour has gone into is this general feeling that loving your country or being nationalistic is wrong, that, yeah. is, is bad, and it's nothing to do with specific yeah. policies or anything, it's just about... Not patriotism. Judging. Yeah, patriotism, yeah. exactly. So, so it is, I, I think you can overdo this, but Labour have been accused of being embarrassed by patriotism. Now, it just happens, there was a very famous case in the UK, this goes back to 2014, when someone called Emily Thornberry, who's very senior in Labour, in fact, she's running as leader, she's not going to get it, but she's running to be leader. She went, there was a by-election in a constituency, in a working-class constituency outside London, and she went to campaign, and she took a photo of a house that had the flag of mm, St. George, yeah. the English flag hanging, and said, welcome to Dagenham, <laughs> or wherever it was. And... People didn't like that. And it looked like she... So it looked like she was just sneering yeah. scornfully at a patriotic working class household. Mm. And nothing could, be, nothing could be worse for Labour than the belief that if you're patriotic, you support mm. the national team and you support the troops mm. if they're doing something overseas, that somehow yeah. they think you're a bit racist. Mm. So, so in as far as, and I don't want to say it, it was true, but in as far as Labour had allowed themselves to be accused of believing that patriotism is racism, um, 
that was very damaging to them. Mm. Uh, before we kind of dive more into the conservative domination as opposed to this, just to loop it in real quickly, do you think this kind of patriotism will be more fulfilled by someone like Keir Starmer, which we were talking about before, whereas the Long Bailey election would be kind of more, I guess, aggression to this patri patriotic sentiment that's missing? Um, yeah, but I, I don't know, actually. I don't know. So Keir Starmer, who, would, as I say, is the favourite to be leader, Keir Starmer is very metropolitan, very southern, very kind of a grown-up graduate sort of candidate. Yeah. So in some ways, his cultural, his cultural appeal may be slightly more metropolitan. Mm -hmm. And he may... He, Rebecca Long-Bailey maybe just feels a little bit less London and a little bit... So we joke about sort of North London, just this place in right. liberal yeah. kind of graduate. Islington Keir Carl. Starmer yeah. is Islington. Yeah. And Rebecca Long-Bailey less so. Um, but I, I think they all know that they need to make sure that no one can say Labour is not a patriotic party. Right. I mean, they would say that's how it was. Mm. But there's no doubt that some people were accusing them of being unpatriotic. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, Labour, I think, economically has switched all over the place in the past 20 years. But, yeah, this cultural issue, which has become such an important issue, I think, beginning with Blair, it's kind of drifted towards this metropolitan base. And, yeah, I think it's yet to, to really find an answer to yeah. how to deal well, with it. Well, look, that. you know, one option, I don't think it would work, one option is just to become a metropolitan liberal party, mm. to be kind of more centrist in the economics. Yeah. And to say we're the party for, you know, people like in this room, young graduates and yeah. people who are not afraid of the world, just to become the Remain party. Mm. Yeah. Labour's problem was, was that never really, it isn't a, it, it wasn't a Remain party. It, it had quite a few mm. Brexiteers. Um, it had himself. quite a bit of, had quite a bit of working class blue collar support. It didn't want to throw that away. And so Labour was slightly trapped between a cultural pitch, cultural pitch, uh, you know, to its liberal activists mm. and a cultural pitch to its northern working right. class voters. Yep. And as I say, for me, the way out of that dilemma is not to give up on the cultural beliefs of the activists. It's just to make sure you're not talking about them all the time. Yep. You're talking about other yep. things. Because, as I say, I don't, think that, I don't think there's that much, actually, of a cultural gap. The, here's, here's the point. So this is a hypothesis. The reason why it feels like we're in a culture war is not because the public disagree about same-sex marriage or race. The reason we, it feels like we're in a culture war is that some of the public believe that the other half, the liberal half, bang on about that, only talk about that, and have forgotten about their, their bus service in their, their town. And they're so busy banging on about, isn't it wonderful how multicultural we are, that they're not talking about buses mm. in Burnley. Mm. And that means it's not that they're against all that multiculturalism, it's that they feel they've lost the elite. The elite are just on a different planet, talking mm. about different things. And what they want is their elite to come back and start worrying about their bus service, not talking about other things. And so that's the hypothesis. I'm not offering that as a as my view, but that's a hypothesis as to what has broken down. Mm. So if you believe that hypothesis and you're a Labour Party, you have to talk about buses less than you're talking about multiculturalism. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, that's, that's, the, that's the theory. But it's fascinating, and it's not just in Britain. That no. I mean, that is... No, the, the Democrats face just, exactly yeah. the same in yeah. the US, yeah. and, and, you know, you you could probably point to every country mm. in Europe as having some similar, some similar breakdown of, of, of relations. Last, last question for this section, just quickly. Um, you know, we've spoken about the pretty tricky questions that these parties are grappling with at the moment and changing trends in society. For the Conservatives, what, what do you think about them going into the future and how long do you think they're going to last? Is it going to be a Conservative party for another decade or actually, could we find the political realignment happen again quite quickly? Well, I, I, 
there was a point there was a point at which we were all talking about a realignment of British politics and a new centrist party and um, the end of the Labour Party. To be absolutely honest, I, I, I'm no expert. My bet is um, I don't write Labour off for the next election, but clearly the Tories would be the favourite to win it. Yeah. Labour have to win a huge number of seats that they've lost um, to win the next election. So you would say it's the Tories to lose. And my bet is the same two parties will be the main two parties. Mm. The, the realignments that occur within British politics seem to occur within these two big parties. So Labour will, will have to do a fair chunk of reinvention. It shows every sign of doing that. Um, if this government turns out to be very good and appeal to people, it's hard for Labour to win the election. If this government screws it up, Labour are in the game and mm. can do it. So um, you've just had a realignment in the Conservative Party. Labour are now going to have to think about how they respond to that. But my bet is that the Labour Party is the vehicle of opposition mm. and that we don't, we don't get any... You know, we don't get new party or anything like that now. We're, we're back to two-party politics no. for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite possible Boris Johnson will be prime minister for, for, for eight, 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 eight to ten years um, because it's very possible that the Tories win the next election. But it's also possible that, they, you know, it's possible that it all goes pear-shaped. Right. You Who know, knows? Brexit could be a disaster. The, 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 the trade could, the economy could sink. We could see all the car companies moving offshore. And, you know, people might just say, why did we ever vote for the guy? So, look, it can go either way. We're, we're very early into this. Let's, uh, let's talk about that going either way, because I think one of the things that could likely screw it up is come December 31st and why people are here with the EU negotiations with Britain. Just to kind of outline about all the things that could go wrong and conservatives could screw up. What is it really to win and lose in both the extremes? Okay, so the conservatives have determined, um, for better or worse, that they want a fairly independent Britain, fairly detached from the EU. They don't want to be signing all sorts of treaties that line up our rules with European rules. They want, it to be, they want Britain to be like Canada. Um, Canada with regard to the US and Canada even with regard to Europe. They want Britain to be just a normal, independent country. They don't want lots of treaties uh, and, and they don't want lots of commitments. So the risk of that, the central risk of that is the distance that they are proposing to make Britain from the European continent makes it very unattractive to base manufacturing activity in the UK if it's about a supply chain with the EU. Because why would you put something in the in UK if you can put it inside the EU, you know, where you don't have borders and you're having to put a truck with customs declarations and all of that? So that's risk number one. We screw up manufacturing. Risk number two is that we lose our biggest industries, which are service industries. So the thing that Britain flourishes in, in exports to the EU, are services, financial services, other services, but that's, what, that's Britain's biggest and best industry in the EU. The second risk is that we cut ourselves off from our biggest market and we lose jobs, revenue and tax revenue because we'll have a less profitable, less profitable services sector. If you manage to lose both your services and your manufacturing, that adds up to a relatively grim <laughs> economic picture in the short term. So that's the kind of worst case scenario. Distant relationship, the EU says, well then you can't sell much of your financial services here, you can't, you're not attractive as a place for manufacturing, and then we, we, we have an economic, economic problem. So that's the worst case. The best case, I suppose, is that we negotiate, because we're not, I, I don't believe for one minute this government is going to make Britain a kind of offshore, deregulated mm. Singapore, 
with environmental, you know, low environmental standards, low agricultural standards, low labour standards. There's no taste for that in the UK at the moment. And given that, my sense is that the EU might generously say, you're obviously not going to be undercutting us. And but the so EU has to think that. I'm not, sure, I'm not so sure the EU... I think the EU's worried about that. You know, Bonnier talks of his level playing field. Yeah. So, so where, where, where there's argument is how specific the commitments to level playing field be, have to be. And whether the EU will just look at us and say, well, actually, your environmental standards seem to be higher than ours. Your agricultural... Your animal welfare standards are higher, not lower. And your labour standards are quite a bit higher than the European minimum. Um, how much weight will the EU put on that if the, if the UK doesn't want to sign a piece of paper committing to that all being part of the, the deal? So the UK doesn't want to sign commitments. This is my reading. The UK doesn't want to sign something saying we guarantee we'll be like this and we, our minimum wage won't go below this, and our working week won't go, go above this. The UK does not want to sign up to that, but I don't think, this is my impression, I'm taking the government at its word, I do not think the UK government is actually about trying to undercut the European Union. And I say that because this is all part of the reinvention of the Conservative Party, as a kind of more working class Northern English party with a slightly more kind of left-wing mm. economic, economic pitch. But you, you already indicated this a bit, but there's really no chance that, you know, come December 31st, UK isn't happy that they just walk away. No, uh, I think that, that, that would be... Um, sorry, I, I should have talked about that. that. That would be a risk, and that would be a... How much? Well, I... I don't know, you know, and it depends how long it is, and it depends how acrimonious the negotiations are at that point, or whether there are side deals for covering some of the difficult areas. But clearly, if we leave with no deal on December the 31st, quite a lot of British goods will face quite large tariffs to get into the EU market. But didn't Boris that said that is it 88% of, of goods... Or is that on the imports? He said 80%, 88% of goods would not face tariffs, up to 88%. Um, some goods will face tariffs, and that will be quite disruptive to some, in, to some industries. And you might say, well, 88% won't face any, but 12% suddenly finding they're more, 30% more expensive... Yeah. And you get big winners and losers. ...is, is, is, is quite, it's quite disruptive. Yeah. And I suppose... One of the questions is how much economics matters to people. Um, so I, my background is economics. And I have had this feeling that in the 90s, Bill Clinton famously said, it's the economy, stupid. And my feeling in the last five years has been it's not the economy, stupid. Mm. <laughs> people are worried about a lot of other things. Than the, they're worried about the dignity of their nation, they're worried about respect and patriotism. They're worried about the rights of people of colour and gender and sexuality to be given respect. So different people are worried about different things. And they're willing to pay an economic price for those mm. things. No. And if you said to Canada, hey, join the United States and you can be 4% richer, the Canadians would laugh at you. Or if you said to the Irish, join the UK, you know, and you can be 5% richer, they would absolutely spit in your face. I mean, they wouldn't, they wouldn't take that as a very nice offer at all. And that's because people, it's not all about economics. Mm. And what we'll come to see over the next two years is, A, how Brexit affects the economy, and B... So that's the really first big question. That's your question, Elmer. How will it affect the economy? But the second big question is, how much will people... How much will it matter to people when it affects the economy? When they actually start losing jobs, 
Will they really think, yes, it is the economy that matters? Mm. Or will they say, hey, we've got our country back. We feel different and it feels nicer. And yeah, we may be 5% poorer, but I don't even care. Yeah. And I did speak to people in the post-referendum period where lots of Remainers were saying no one voted for their country to be poorer. And actually, there were leavers who were saying, no, I'm absolutely fine. I, I understand we may be a bit poorer. My, my old economics teacher yeah. said exactly that. He said, I'm willing to you know, lose a bit of GDP yeah. if um, we regain our sovereignty. If, if, if we gain and he was an economics yeah, teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, know, I know a lot of people like that. No, you know, 5% poorer. It's, it's, it's not about that. It's, it, it's about mm. that's not the test. Um, so, we'd, so we'll see what the economic effect is, and we'll also see whether economics comes back to feel more important. Mm. You know, it's easy to say in abstract, oh, it's not economics. Mm. But when it's your job or when it's your 5% of income, right. maybe economics will matter. But we're, we're, we, we, mm. you know, who's to say at this point? Yeah, it's really I'm aware of, uh, of time, but I want to quickly ask you about how you see these negotiations in terms of Britain's kind of global positioning. And it's already, it's kind of seen to be placed in between the EU and the US. They operate in different regulatory spheres. And um, the UK has to make some decisions about you know, where it wants to stand geopolitically. And so how do you think that's going to play out? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, so we always were inside the EU we were the bridge to the United States. That's how we saw ourselves, right? We were, we were the European... We were the, we were the best... We were the closest European ally of the US. And my guess is Britain will continue to try and be that. And will continue to try to be the American European and the European American or deputy to the American show. That could end so badly. Um, what? That could end so badly, trying um, to play both sides. It's now, a risky game. Could end up very badly. It's obviously more complicated by the relationship with the particular incumbent in the White House, mm. who is less transatlanticist than previous ones, right? So he's less NATO, he's less into the world which could push the UK towards the EU. Which can push the UK on, on, on Iran. And you know, on, on and basically, the UK has been much more. Since Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, we have been much more in the European ambit than the American ambit, by my reading. Mm. We've been picking fights with the US. Like um, the Huawei decision. Huawei, what, what Iran, um, the Sekula's extradition. Um, Climate change, you know, we're hosting the next climate change summit this year, the big one in Glasgow this year. We are throwing everything at climate change. Mm. We're announcing stuff this year. Um, very different to the US, the US approach. I just want, I'm interested to hear your opinion on the Huawei decision and whole topic. Do you think it's a big security risk or do you think... I've no idea. I've no idea. I mean, look, I think the British government have been advised we can manage the risk. Mm. So they've taken that, yeah. they've taken the position, they've been advised. Um, it's, <sighs> the whole risk is that it involves distinguishing between the periphery of the 5G network and the core. Mm. So there's no Huawei in the core. Well, I mean, you know, the critique of the British government position is that there is no distinction between right. the periphery and the yeah. core. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, we'll see. We, 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 we'll find out. But you know, the, the report is that Trump was very cross with, John, yeah, with Boris yeah. Johnson, and was 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 really peed off about it. And um, yeah, we'll see what the uh, what the effect is. It's too bad you didn't know the full answer because James has been waiting to ask that question <laughs> all week. <laughs> That's um, true. We need to do the audience question, and is it okay if we go five minutes over yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah. Whatever you like. Yeah. I'm talk a bit about facts which will be slightly yeah. controversial. Um, any more audience questions at all? Right there. Okay, I saw Blue Shirt will do two. So right there in the scarf, orange, if you can stand up. I was wondering whether Labour indeed did lose its core issue 
and that's not merely one bus line, but the organization of the economy. And to dare to speak the tremendous S word, socialism, the democratic socialism. The same problem is here in Holland. Uh, if you think that democracy is the ideal form of government on political issues, then shouldn't we also say that this should be the ideal form of government for economical issues? And uh, the question of whether you either should uh, uh, choose for a democratic collectivization of core industries and services, you still have the public health, you still have the public yeah. transport, yeah. but the European Union demands uh, privatization. Is that a problem? What is Corbyn's position here? And how does this relate to... Uh, the growth of poverty in the last years in England, I have yeah. understood it's quite tremendous and quite <coughs> severe. Okay, big question. Yeah, it's a big question. So look, um, so Jeremy Corbyn instinctively is, 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 is socialist. I mean, he's, he, he totally believes in much more nationalization, much more ownership of the um, economic resources by the state, and much more democratic control over the economy. That is, that is Jeremy Corbyn's position. And, you know, I, I work for the BBC, so I have no views on the merits of that or the um, demerits of that. Um, the, the difficulty is, w is whether, there is a, w whether you get enough support among the British public for that position. And, you know, broadly speaking, you've got to get 45% of the voters on, one si on your side to win a comfortable majority and to govern the country. And so you need a pitch that can attract 45% of the voters. And um, the truth is, England, and I say England, has not looked like a very socialistically inclined country. Scotland tends to vote much more left-wing. Wales has tended to vote much more left-wing. England, not so much. So I don't know when, I haven't got the figures, but Labour would have struggled to get a majority government. If, if, if it was just about England, English votes, I think you have to go back a very long way for Labour to be getting, you know, to be getting a majority. Um, now, I don't know why that is. I don't know what the cultural history is there. But that is, that is the, the, the difficulty for the Corbyn pitch, is that... Broadly speaking, um, there are enough people who quite like the existing system that you don't, you, you don't win an election overthrowing it. Now, I don't say that... I mean, a lot of us, after the crash in 2008, really did think there would be a much more radical economic opinion among the public and that, and that you might get a kind of you might get a taste for much more radical economics and you know you did because Jeremy Corbyn Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn got 40% of the vote in, in, 1970, in, in 2017 so yes there was a kind of a shift left in British politics but it just didn't seem to be enough to win an election now you know, it has its merits, and in this election, we did argue about them in quite a lot of areas. The most notable was broadband, where the Corbyn plan was to nationalise broadband, to give it to everybody free, and, you know, to have a national broadband service that went to areas that have got very weak broadband, and to, and to make it much more as the, the socialist broadband, in the way you're describing, like the National Health Service. That's broadband. And it did, it did have quite a lot of appeal to people. So it wasn't, it wasn't that people said, I don't like it. It polled, I think, reasonably well. But I just think there was a suspicion about taking that too far, really. I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm just going on what the polls say and what the commentators say. It just didn't feel like the public entirely trusted the idea that you would take it all the way to its logical conclusion. We so need that to was a difficult pitch. cut off the audience yeah, questions. Yeah. I'm sorry for that because we do want to reserve five minutes more okay. for the conversation we were having kind of backdoor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to kind of go right into the topic because you're part of a mainstream media outlet, but it seems there's been an increased level of polarization when it comes to mainstream news. Do you think that there is like 
any point in using facts when talking about public affairs, since people have such a different interpretation on it, will shout fake news before anything is really yeah. fully explained. Right, so this has become a very, very difficult issue for broadcasters. The BBC holds itself as impartial. Um, you can argue about what impartiality really means, but the BBC, what the BBC doesn't do is come out like The Guardian or The Daily Mail and say, vote this way, or it doesn't try to present the evidence in one way or the other. In a polarized time, bam, back to the 15% at each end of the kind of culture war, the, the population, this side believe you're with us or against us, and that side believe you're with us or against us, they all thus believe that we're not, because we're not with them, we're against them. So we've been under unique amount of pressure and impartiality and trust in the BBC has been under strain. I'm happy to say there's a huge swathe of people in the middle who still think the BBC is, broadly speaking, doing a good job, but there are people at each end who don't. <laughs> Wait, about this topic but, of impartiality, yeah. though, could we define that real quickly? Just well, I, you see, I think it's a, it's a state of mind in which you're trying to be fair to both sides yeah. of the argument. There isn't, impartiality doesn't mean, you say, on the one hand, the earth is round, on the other hand, some say the earth is flat. I mean, I, it doesn't mean that, but it does mean trying to be fair to each side of the argument, to present the argument as they would put it, and to put difficult questions where there are difficult questions to each side. Now, the issue comes up about facts, because the BBC does not want to be impartial on facts. We believe in facts, and we support facts, and we have our own fact-checking service that will try and present the facts as we see them. And a lot of the time we're criticized for not taking up the other side and correcting the lies of the other side. This is where impartiality and the issue of facts and fake news merge. The problem for us is that most of the arguments are not about facts. They're about judgments. So can we, do we have to have a border in Northern Ireland if we, if we leave the EU? Um, is immigration too high? What will be the economic effect on the car industry if we, if we Brexit, hard Brexit? Um, you know, these are, is Boris Johnson going to sell the National Health Service to American drug companies, as, as, as was said in the election campaign? These, these are not facts. These are judgments. And in my view, the right way for the public to come to a view on these judgments is to litigate them in public discourse, is to argue about them, is to put them on the table, argue, debate, you know, and then decide. And that's what we do. But each, the, I think there are people on each side who genuinely believe these judgments are facts, and it's our job just to explain them to the public. And... I don't think we can do that because I don't think they are facts. I think they're, they're questionable. And so we need, to, we need to let them be argued. And then people will say, well, if you let it be argued, you're obviously taking sides by not coming down on one side. You've taken the other side's point of view. And that's why it's been really, really difficult. And what I've observed is, is at a time when people are very tribal in their views, and this applies to you, every one of you in here, if you feel strongly about something, you lose, your critical, you lose your critical faculties when judging the facts of the case. At the moment, I'm watching the very excellent Netflix series, The People vs. O.J. Simpson. Have any of you seen mm. People vs. O.J. Simpson? Great show. So this is about a really big court case, criminal case in the U.S. in the 1990s. I can remember it. You can't. It was the most amazing, amazing... Um, murder case and everybody stopped viewing it about the evidence they were judging it through the colour of the skin of the defendant their colour of skin whether they hated the police or liked the police 
all these tribal identity issues governed people's view of whether the guy did it. He obviously did it. Um, it, 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 it what governed their view was the, w w w all these other things. So if you feel strongly about something, your job is to fight against, is, is to fight in favour of having an open mind. And it is to, it is to try and listen and understand the other side's point of view and to ask yourself, can I summarise what the other side is saying? How would I argue their point of view as strongly as I can? Because you, if you feel strongly about something, will believe any amount of bullshit on, that favours your side of the argument. And that's the thing you've got to fight against. And that's, that's why it's become very difficult for broadcasters trying to be impartial when there are so many people who feel very strongly that this is a fact and it's your job to explain it do, when we don't think Do you so. still have hope that some consensus on these nowadays deeply polarizing issues like gender or climate change, do you think there's still hope for, for consensus? Um, I think the jury's out. I, I, I think things have, in, in, in our country, I think things have calmed down. Mm. Last year was amazing yeah. and I think it has calmed down. Um, and we'll see whether... So it's very interesting that the Brexit debate after the election, it became a culture war thing around Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. Remainers supported Meghan Markle. Brexiteers supported William and Kate and didn't like Meghan Markle. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's crude, but that, broadly speaking, became the next, the next front of the, of the culture war. Um, and I, can, I, I could see these things carrying on, but at the same time, I think it has calmed down a little bit. Okay. And I'm, 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 I'm sort of vaguely optimistic that we'll become a little bit less tribal, we'll argue a little bit less, and we will look at facts a little bit more um, and sort of use our judgment in a slightly less instinctively tribal way, which will be no bad Hopefully thing. some British moderation and sensible <laughs> behaviour at last. <laughs> Um, it's been great having you. We're coming to our, our final question. And, and we noticed on your website, you say, and this is the, the quote, I'm sometimes paid for external events, but there is no point in quoting some generic price for my services as I ruthlessly price discriminate. It may cost you nothing. It may cost you thousands. Our question is simple. Why did you decide to come here for nothing? <laughs> um. Because it's actually, it's interesting, partly because I, I like going to universities and talking to students. Um, and it's partly, bec partly because I also love Amsterdam. And it's nice to have a, a day trip here. And I, I visited the Olympic Stadium this morning. I have never been there before and I wanted to visit it. So I went there this morning. Um, but it's partly a little bit of UK PR, actually. I mean, we've had a very bad year. <laughs> Get, getting and, on the European side again. And, <laughs> and I kind of think um, if, you get, if you're British and you get an invitation to kind of speak to nice people overseas at the moment, we should probably take it up just to present so that you can understand our country is not entirely insane. <laughs> um, it is, a little bit. We're, we're grappling with a lot, a lot of stuff um, that came out of the referendum. Um, but we are kind of quite nice people, really. And we do love... We, 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 whatever position you take on Brexit, Britain is still part of Europe mm. and is not intending to leave. So I'm hoping you won't entirely... You won't entirely feel the UK has abandoned you or deserted you or has swum into the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. <laughs> um, no, we're still here, still in business. And uh, it's lovely to be here, to, t to be able to say that. Well, thank you very much for coming. Please, uh, a thank big round of applause. Me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, announcement.